So the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Girl. Never thought I'd be sitting yeah. down here having a conversation with you, but here we are. I know. Well, I mean, the first uh, contact, the first interaction we had, not direct interaction, was your reaction to my Cuties review. Yeah, I kind of wanted to start with that. Um, I feel like we have. I feel like we should uh, acknowledge that that happened. Yeah. Yeah. There's. I mean, of course, you know, as always, there's a lot of people in my chat, you know, saying you're a pedo and whatnot. I'm sure you're kind of used to, unfortunately, those kind of accusations. So, are you a pedophile? Um. Well, what do you mean? <clears throat> I don't remember too much from your Mister Girl or uh, from your from your cuties review. I don't remember too yeah. much of it. But I do remember pretty distinctly you saying the video, the movie was hot. The, uh I said the girls in the movie were kind of, I think I said pretty hot. Oh no, I think I said the dancing scenes were pretty hot. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of stuff definitely like gives put, puts a bad taste in my mouth. If you're sure, gonna say that like the eleven year old girls twerking and whatever was like hot, I I think that's kind of yes. creepy. Yes, I can I can really empathize with that. Okay, so. That's kind of where I, where I'm getting at with uh, that the question of are you a pedophile? <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess um, part of what I was trying to get at with the are you gonna are you interviewing me briefly at this moment? I mean, yeah. What I guess it? this is kind of just the beginning of the conversation. I'm I'm fine talking yeah. about other subjects, but I feel like sure. that's kind of the elephant in the room we should probably address. That you sort of called me a pedophile. I don't remember if I called you a pedophile. I don't think or you not. really did. I think you just said it was really weird. It, I think. I mean, it so still think, kind of weirds me out. <laughs> so yeah, I can see that. Um, I think. I think part of. I can. I'm gonna turn myself down a little bit because I can tell I'm gonna be yelling a lot. Uh, I think. One problem is that people view the cuties review with the assumption that I'm proud of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my content is more about like disclosing weird things about myself. So I wasn't saying, um, I, I didn't, I, I don't really like moralizing or virtue signaling, mm -hmm. as you may have noticed. So I don't want to say it made me hot and there, and that's what makes me uncomfortable or blah, blah, blah. I kind of want to just say like the blunt, you know, raw truth of my reaction, regardless of whether it makes me look good or bad or weird or sane or insane. So I was more saying, um, I, uh, you know, I called it an uncomfortably honest review. It wasn't. I wasn't trying to say like, of course it was, of course it was hot. Just like I expected it would be, or just as just as we all we all know it's hot. That there's more more saying. Um, and and it was not a admission that I'm a pedophile. My point is that, um, in spite of not being a pedophile, I found cuties kind of hot. Hmm. It's the contradiction uh, I mean, I can, there. Yeah, I can I can understand what you mean that maybe like yeah. you were you uncomfortable. Yeah, well I know, but you were uncomfortable with the fact that you as a not pedophile found the movie of eleven year old girls hot. I just feel like but that's but, still kind of coming across a little pedophilic. Sure, sure, sure. But here's the other problem is that at the same time, I'm I also kind of am comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with my discomfort. I'm comfortable with going into the dark cave of my um, sexuality okay. and not flinching at what I find there. So I'm not um, – if we go by the the clinical definition of pedophile, I don't think I meet it. So um, would you be more of a um, – what's the, the term? Is it like a hebophile or something like that? No, I think my primary age of attraction is uh, around my age. Okay. I'm willing to make an exception for my girlfriend who is 10 years younger than me. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, again, I, I just, I, I totally understand like what you're saying that it made you kind of uncomfortable at the time, but you were sharing yeah. it anyway. Um, I, okay, I don't know. Okay. I, if, if I said, imagine if I made a review of, um, end game mm -hmm. and I'm like, um, I'm I so let's pretend I'm I'm a mostly straight guy or I'm let's say let's say I am straight I'm straight and I'm married and I'm like a Christian conservative or something okay mm -hmm. and then I'm making a review and I say like you know but uh, Captain America's ass was pretty nice that scene where he said this is America's ass I found myself like kind of checking his ass out he he has a nice ass mm -hmm. he, he, that scene was kind of hot 
and you know I say this as a, a straight guy I don't think that everybody would then be like oh this means you're gay or they could maybe they would but my my point is um I'm trying to say something about the movie not about myself right no I I, I understand that like finding some things here and there attractive don't necessarily define your sexuality I think that that's a, right. a fair assumption but it's a little yeah. different, at least in my mind, when the thing that you're finding attractive are children dancing well, in, like, different. sexual ways. Yeah. It is kind of different. <laughs> and, it's more controversial, but also there's a... I feel like there's a witch hunt going on. There's a, there's a pedophile witch hunt happening where well, everybody's trying to figure out who's a groomer, who's a pedophile, and everyone's trying to position themselves as not a pedophile and not a groomer. And and mm-hmm. I and I I also hate witch hunts. I hate the whole dogpiling mentality, the whole suspicion, the paranoia, the accusations, the reading between the lines, outing each other. It just feels um, very unhealthy. And I can agree with that. That kind of falls in line with some of the like cringe with cancel culture and whatever. But I okay, just so that but that you were doing a little bit of that in your video. No, would because you, I feel like your you video that you made that? it it wasn't reading between the lines. Like it was pretty blunt what you were saying, which was that you found the minors attractive. Yeah, but so well that's pedophilic. I mean, if I got up here on camera and was saying like, "Yeah, I'm I'm not generally attracted to children but you know there was this one scene where there were these like prepubescent girls they were dancing sexually and i don't know i thought it was hot it kind of turned me on like that's definitely that that maybe not okay if we want to get really technical i think maybe maybe that does not make you a pedophile in the sense that you are exclusively attracted to children but it's definitely touching on like a pedophilic uh line i would say like you're you're getting into that really uncomfortable territory yes Okay, so my thesis mm-hmm. of my upcoming kind of deep dive into pedophilia is that part of the reason that we're so concerned with uh, outing groomers and pedophiles online mm-hmm. is that social media companies have created a very d- dangerous environment for children mm-hmm. where any of your fans, any of my fans can uh, DM us privately we could we could groom we could be grooming kids left and right if we wanted to the tools sure. to do so are dropped into our laps and the fans are dropped into our laps too they're delivered to us by by these platforms and by their algorithms and then by the t- video calling sharing photo sharing tools anonymity uh, uh, fake accounts well, I, every, anything we want right um, in terms of taking advantage of children we can have in a way that like it was such a huge scandal like michael jackson having kids over to his house in the 90s Mm -hmm. can you imagine in the 90s if like michael michael jackson was having private video calls with children that would i mean i thought that there was a huge scandal well i i recognize and i'm not too familiar with the michael jackson thing directly but it was my understanding that there was more than just him there was more than just like kids being over at his house what what they were sleeping in his bed with him yeah, so that's pretty yikesy. That's pretty uncomfortable shit. Yes, but um, now um, nobody seems to really bat an eye at the tools for child grooming and child abuse being um, really easily available to creators. Right. And even and not creators, in communities. I, I mean, especially Discord, but uh, Twitter too. Mm-hmm. I think that we are kind of self-policing to try to make up for for what I think is a unsafe situation for children. I don't think there's any amount of you pointing fingers at me and calling me a pedophile or or a weirdo or whatever that is going to make up for the fact that if I want to groom underage members of my audience, I can do so very very easily, and no amount of calling me out on it is. I mean. It, the other thing is that kids um, think it's funny. Like, what kids, do they, what do they kids are not... Funny? Like, I was very popular on TikTok until I got banned, mm-hmm. um, which also has private DMs. So when you call me a pedophile... not that, I'm not saying you call me a pedophile, but when, when you 
make implications. Ask about it, yeah. Okay. When you ask about it, yeah, you're just asking questions. When you ask about it, um, it doesn't it doesn't make the kids in my audience any safer. It doesn't make them want to stay away from me or not talk to me. Yeah, but it sounds like we're having two different conversations here because I agree that right. there well, are a lot of tools available to virtually anybody online that gives them mm -hmm. the ability to easily groom fans or groom children, and that's absolutely yes. a problem. And <clears throat> I, I, I want to say that is the problem that I think. But don't you think it's hunting... also a problem to be like sympathetic towards the attractions that pedophiles have? No, not really. Really? You don't think that that gives yeah. it like a level of, of validity or justification there? So just really quickly, if I could elaborate, I my opinion on pedophilia is generally that if there are people who have attractions to prepubescent kids, then they should obviously seek help. I disagree with the idea of like what you said, like a witch hunt. I think that we need to reduce the stigma so that they're more comfortable seeking help. So I, I okay, think that we... We would probably have you acknowledge some... that your video about my cuties review did the opposite of that. What do you mean? Well, you're clearly dogpiling, adding to stigma. You're not. You're not saying like, "Hey, listen, listen, Mister Girl. I haven't heard of you before. I know you're kind of new to blah 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 and um, new to like being a bigger creator now. But now you're making the rounds, and I want you to know I think you need help. And you know, if you if you need advice or someone to talk to you're struggling with these feelings blah blah you you weren't saying that you're saying like look at this fucking weirdo well yeah because there's a couple things is i think generally speaking pedophiles should seek help if you have attractions i think you should seek help also but okay. if a pedophile and i'm not saying you're a pedophile but generally as an example yeah. if a pedophile or if somebody who seems sympathetic to pedophilic attractions is on the internet you know loudly exclaiming how they found these girls hot or the dancing was attractive to them or whatever, then I think mm -hmm. that I could also call that out while sticking and being very consistent to my position that, hey, you should seek help. And I recognize that some of that stigma can be dangerous. But I, I want to make a very crucial distinction here, which is non-offending pedophiles. So Sure. I feel like obviously yeah. well, there's we're, we're a gonna assume not well let's let's assume non offending throughout this conversation. Right. So, and obviously I, I there's a call... difference though between you like or somebody, not you directly, but somebody harming an actual child, um, and mm -hmm. then just having those attractions. But mm -hmm. I think that you were definitely treading the line with that because it seemed that you were pretty openly expressing your attractions on the internet, which I feel is pretty harmful in a lot of ways i feel like if anything you are adding validation to these attractions that pedophiles have and i think that there are better ways of going about that i think if anything it's like hey if you found this video hot then maybe you should seek help but also if you're going to post a video where you exclaim how hot it was i feel like that's deserving of criticism as well sure but again you could still make a video that's like hey i don't think that you're handling this responsibly I think that by airing out these ideas or feelings that you're having that, uh, you know, you may think you're doing something funny or you may think you're doing something insightful or but but you're not you're adding to this problem that is going to end up in children getting harmed because you're sort of validating this thing. That's a problem. And if you have I, just, I still think there's a way to say that that mm -hmm. would not be stigmatizing. But are you saying that you are unwilling to acknowledge that um, mocking me for being a weirdo? potentially adds to the stigmatization of uh, pedophilic urges? Um, it might, but I think that there still needs to exist a level of stigma. So I don't think that it needs to be completely destigmatized to the point of people like, hey, I watched this movie, there was an 11-year-old girl, it was really fucking hot, you know, I got a big old boner in my pants because of it. I feel like that's probably going too far, whereas I feel like the type of mm -hmm. stigma that I want to remove is more of the sort of... Um, the, the heavy witch hunt, I guess, kind of like what you were talking about. And the idea is like more of the stigma within the medical field as well. So like <clears throat> there have been plenty of stories I've heard of uh, people who have these attractions. They recognize that those attractions are wrong. But when they seek help, they end up being stigmatized by like a mental health professional or, or a medical professional or whatever. I, that's more of the stigma that I'm talking about. I think that there still needs to exist a level of stigmatization uh, against people with these attractions and with these urges, at least enough so that they're willing to seek help. It's not normal, and it shouldn't be accepted 
that you're attracted to an 11 year old child or younger. And I think that there there's a a, a line there. I, I recognize I how I you agree with that. Well, I recognize how you might feel like this sounds a little bit hypocritical, but I feel as though there is absolutely a line. And although that line might be arbitrary, there has to be some kind of a line between the removing of stigmatization enough so that pedophiles can seek help while also stigmatizing <laughs> it enough so that pedophiles know, hey, this is not OK. This is wrong. You okay. need to and seek so help. As a, as a commentator, you see yourself conveniently in the position of it being responsible for you to uphold and perhaps increase this, this stigmatization. I don't think that I increased the stigmatization unless you're talking about the one video that you posted. I was willing to criticize it for, yeah, it was pretty creepy when you're saying 11 year olds are hot. But generally speaking, I'm also in favor of reducing the stigma so much so but that people, pedophiles can the, seek help. The people in your audience are the people who are going to grow up and become mental health counselors and doctors. Like, I just I don't think it's um, a, a witch hunt in a dog pile usually each person is just throwing a pebble but i don't would say with your audience size it's more of like a rock but just one rock but when you've got you know ten thousand people each throwing one rock um it's it's quite a lot right and i i guess i could i would be willing to bite a bullet that the video in which i criticized you may have contributed somewhat to an overall stigma. But again, right. I think that there needs to be a stigma. Like, there still needs to be a level of stigmatization. And no, I'm not saying that I'm like the perfect middle grounded guy that happens to just know exactly where that line is. But do you not agree that there needs to be a level of removing the stigmatization so much so that they can seek help while also destigmatize or... Let me let me put it this way. Do you think that we should okay. destigmatize people who have those attractions while still stigmatizing the idea of loudly and proudly preaching about having those attractions? Mm, I disagree. I think that if the more open people are about their attractions or feelings generally and the more open people are allowed to be socially and um like actually i mean my video got taken down too but i would say that would make the world a better place i am i'm in favor of people expressing their thoughts and feelings okay i mean yeah even, I, I even if they make the, the rest of us uncomfortable right but I, I think that this goes a step further than just making people uncomfortable i think that this is is offering a level of validation to wrong attractions harmful urges that still need to be like if somebody has those urges i feel like they should be seeking help more than they should be on the internet talking about how hot they thought it was if that makes sense it makes sense if uh i think so this is another problem i have is i think another way that we're trying to increase safety on the internet is by imposing a puritanical hyper normative view of uh the range of thoughts and feelings that we have mm -hmm. and so I think that um, telling people if you have ever, if you if you thought the girls twerking and cuties were hot, you need to seek psychological help is a little ridiculous. I don't I don't agree with that. I think that, I think again you're trying to make up for um, like an unsafe situation that uh, kids are in and have been kind of thrust into by social media companies. Well, but I think I that the video, the cuties, was putting kids in a pretty dangerous and uncomfortable situation too. But where, what's the difference to you in your mind between destigmatization and then normalization? I think it is normal to have sexual thoughts and feelings about people that you generally are not attracted to or fixated on uh, being attracted to. I think, I think. Um, our sexual fantasies are pretty broad and untamed um, at times and can be triggered by all kinds of things. I think, uh, you know, the, ac the actresses are 12 to 14. So I think a 14-year-old twerking in front of the camera is, is a pretty reasonable thing to be um, aroused by. I and I, and I, and or, I'm not even reasonable, but normal. And I don't think that that is indicative of mental illness. 
I think that the, the normal view of mental illness and like, and so like, if I said this in, in like an academic setting, it would just, n I don't think anybody would, no one would be like, wait a second, you sick fuck. It would just be kind of accepted as like, well, that's obviously true. But you come into online world and everybody, everybody's like a fucking um, nun. And I, and I mean, I, I so, think it's just it's when there's a video like the cuties thing that is heavily sexualizing underage girls. Yeah, that that is putting first of all, it's putting those children in a bad situation. I think that the movie producers were totally wrong for making that film to begin with. And I think that it was I pretty. Think, exploitative. I, well, I think I, I think I said that in my review. OK, so I can also acknowledge that, yeah, there, there needs to be a balance between the destigmatization and getting rid of that uh, heavy witch hunt. But and I listen, wait, wait. hold on, wait, 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 really quick. I'll Cheryl, even acknowledge, though, that I was contributing probably more than probably. I would have liked to to sure. the stigmatization in that situation. But I also okay. still am holding by the fact that I think that there needs to be You're a level. You're saying I should have made that video. No, I, I'm not saying that, okay? I think that there needs to be a level of stigmatization there still, and then I think that we need to distinguish between destigmatizing so much so that pedophiles can seek help while also yeah. not normalizing that kind of behavior. Okay, so I, my, I guess part of my problem is the blurring of actions versus thoughts. So you're kind of, you're, you're putting me in the same boat you're, you're, as the producers of the movie so if no, I, I say I, well, I didn't mean to if that was i'm not trying to okay well i want to i want to not put myself in the same boat i want there to be a distinction between oh yeah you know i watched that movie and like it was kind of hot i was like oh, that's weird versus me being like you know what i'm gonna have 500 12 year old girls twerk for me and you know as an audition and figure out which ones i think would be the best for my movie about 12 or 11 year olds twerking and then I'm going to film them, and I'm going to make the movie, and I'm going to sell it. That's not something I would do. Sure. Um, and I recognize the difference there between thoughts and between think, actions. I might think about doing it, but I'm not going to actually do it. Well, I... And I, I and, sorry, go ahead. And so a lot... And I feel that that is missing in this conversation a lot. So when, you talk, when you're talking about normalizing, I'm... My channel is more broadly kind of focused on saying hey we all have thoughts that are weirder than we would like to admit mm -hmm. i'm not trying to normalize the thought okay there's two there's two ways we can kind of shift that mm -hmm. i think i'm often interpreted as saying like um we should redefine thinking a 11 year old is hot as normal mm -hmm. and i'm more saying we should be, we should redefine what is acceptable to talk about and expand that into things that are not normal. Again, I'm, I'm okay talking about these issues, I guess, but I think that the way those conversations need to be had need to be responsible. Um, and I, I'm not putting you in the same boat as the producers. Obviously, you having a thought that the girls were hot is not at mm. all the same as no. making the video I i'm not saying that do it anything is. but but wouldn't you say that the action to a degree is making the 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 video that you made in which you are very open about you know i found it hot it was it was mm -hmm. cool it was arousing i feel I like that I, I feel like that conversation wasn't as responsible as it could have been and i feel like that's why it offers a bit of validation to people that might have that kind of attraction like I feel like in a way that's getting into the territory of normalizing it. Uh, I don't want to moralize about, again, I want to, there's nothing wrong with fantasizing about children. I think I would disagree with you on that. I There's know. nothing you can think, do about think, it legally. Think, you can't arrest people and be the thought police. But if you think we we shouldn't be able, even if we could, we shouldn't. Yeah, we but should if you're regular, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to have that conversation. I'm trying to pinpoint the fact but that if you, you are regularly you... having fantasies involving underage pu prepubescent children, that kind of sounds like a pedophile. Yeah, I would say if it gets really regular, more than once a week. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, I know it's arbitrary, but other people, 
I, I don't know. Like, like at a yeah, I'd say I would say if it. I would just call someone a pedophile. If either I didn't like them, or if they were having sexual fantasies about kids that made up like more than fifty percent of their fantasy life, I would say at that point it's maybe maybe even thirty percent, maybe even twenty percent. I would say you're starting to get into like. So what do you think that person should do? Let's say somebody's having f sexual fantasies 50% of the time about children. Um, I think we both agree that we shouldn't be like, you sick fucking heathen. You need to get a put in front of a firing squad. I'm, I'm definitely against like the violent calls well, good. Uh, when it comes to like people that have those attractions and urges. But don't you think that a level of stigmatization should probably exist there for good reason? I don't think so. I think it's, I think my view is more like, um, anorexia, you know, we've got, uh, criteria. If you meet the criteria for anorexia or you're starting to, you should go get help. And, and, and I'm not stigmatizing it. It's just like you have a problem and the, this problem is going to start hurting you. It's going to start hurting your friends and family. It's, it's a destructive thing in your life. I think anorexia has the biggest, the highest mortality rate of any psychological disorder. So like you uh like Eugenia Cooney. Mhm. Mm um I think this is a good comparison for not I I understand this may not resonate with you but this is how I see pedophilia. Mhm. Mm we we get distracted by the fact that a person having a sexual fantasy is on some level physiologically enjoying the fantasy but ultimately it's not it's not a disorder that any of us want to be saddled with. I can um, agree with that. Yeah, you, like, but again, that's getting in the territory of non-offending pedophiles. And when I say that, I I'm usually... only talking about non-offending pedophile for this for this entire conversation. When I say pedophile, I am only referring to the attraction to children and fantasies about children. I am not referring to any anyone, anyone's actions. Okay, but don't you feel like when you say, yeah, maybe they're a pedophile if they have like thirty to fifty percent uh, sexual fantasies involving children? Don't you mm -hmm. feel like that standard is pretty arbitrary just the same way as me saying, hey, there's got to be a line between the destigmatization and still keeping that stigma? Yeah, yeah. Wait, can I just walk you through this? Sure. Okay. I will keep it brief. Um, I don't think stigmatization is going to keep anorexic people from starving to death. And I similarly don't think stigmatization keeps pedophiles from acting on their urges or keeps them from having their urges. I think that um, we should treat it more like an affliction. Mm -hmm. if, if they're not offending, it's only hurting them. Mm -hmm. I can agree with this so far, yeah. Okay, so, in, so I don't see stigmatizing um, thoughts and feelings as a necessary step or really a guard against someone acting on those things. What I would like is for us, and I know I realize this may be a extremely unrealistic goal, but I'm, and I'm not trying to really accomplish this because I know a lot of people just aren't capable of this, but I would like to nudge us, some of us, closer to, we all think about all kinds of bad things. Rappers talk about killing people. People who write horror movies talk about killing people, raping people. We play video games. We shoot people. I think we all have uh, fantasies about doing things that we should not do, and we can recognize we should not do them without having to also say we should not fantasize about them. I guess I recognize that people have certain fantasies, but again, it's the likelihood of that fantasy leading to harm, I think, that would need to be considered. So if somebody... and I. Yeah, I don't want to evaluate that. When I'm playing Call of Duty, I don't want some asshole watching me play and saying, like, well, wait a second. You seem to really enjoy blowing that person's head off. What is What does this mean? That's like, if I, if I start actually fantasize, if I, if, if I start, like, planning to blow people's heads off or... It, it turned or my fantasy about blowing someone's head off it starts to become this recurring intense thing then like yeah at some point if it gets to the point where it could be considered like a sexual orientation then like yeah i think i should get help for it but i don't think i need to be shamed for it 
Okay. I guess I saw a question in chat, which is, um, how do you think that they will seek help if there isn't at least a level of stigma? Because I'm in favor, again, of reducing the stigmatization, but there has to still be a level of stigma, at least in my mind. How do you how do you kind of reconcile that? How, how do people seek help if there doesn't exist some level of stigma? I, I guess I agree that it should be stigmatized in the way anorexia is stigmatized or, or ideally would be as it's hurting you. Not that you, you aren't hurting anybody with your thoughts, but at some point, if you're, if you're having intense sexual feelings about children all the time, that is going to start hurting you. Sure. Uh, I, I can, it's, it's, iso it's like isolating and embarrassing and scary. And, um, yeah. And I agree also you can't, just, you can't be just to cut in here, like, like you can't have a fulfilling sex life. Well, I agree by the way that like the isolation of people who have these attractions and urges is definitely wrong because it's a fact that that makes it more likely that they will actually offend and harm a child. So I can recognize that some of the way that stigma manifests itself so far as isolating pedophiles or treating them as total social outcasts, that mm -hmm. that's wrong. That's the kind of stigma that I would definitely be against. But I just feel like because earlier you were like, well, so you're you're just the one sitting in the center. You're you know where the stigma should and shouldn't end. But it sounds to me like you're saying something similar, which is if somebody has these thoughts 30 to 50 percent of the time, which sounds like an arbitrary number that you kind of just made up, then maybe that makes them a pedophile. Isn't that just as arbitrary as what I'm saying, that there needs to exist some level of stigma, but also we need to reduce some level of stigma as well? Given that it, it is and should be illegal to have sex with kids, and also given that even if it were legal, um, wanting to marry a nine-year-old who's going to go through puberty in first, first of all, who can't understand what's happening, mm -hmm. whose parents definitely don't want you to marry or have sex with them, who is going to go through puberty imminently is even if it were legal and completely accepted by society, somehow it would still be a completely nonsensical delusional um, thing to do. It, it just, it pedophilia doesn't really make sense. Uh, as like a, a lifestyle. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm focused on the protecting children. It should be illegal. It is illegal and it should stay illegal. And then protecting pedophiles who are harmed by their disorder. Okay, I mean, at the very surface level, I can agree with you there, but I definitely Great. think that we have a lot of disagreements as far as yes. uh, uh, how, like, what level of stigma we should remove, and then what would make somebody a pedophile as as what, how often are they having these fantasies and these arousals that would kind of define that there. And I guess those do are really arbitrary lines at the end of the day. But well, do you do you do you at least understand where I'm coming from in saying that online spaces? are over stigmatizing of everything and that the view of what is a normal person espoused by YouTube commentators is extremely unrealistic and almost demands that people be um, really fake and shallow all the time or they're considered like out outcast like psychologically damaged like insane people I, I can agree with that to a certain degree yeah I mean even there was a um there are even issues with people on Twitter claiming that like if a dude is who's older is dating a woman who's like over 21 that that's somehow like creepy or grooming or something like that so yeah yeah I, I can agree that there like, are call me Carson I feel like call me Carson is the best test case of like this is clearly going too far I don't remember I, exactly what happened there. I would have to look into he it. He asked for nudes from a 17-year-old when he was 19, and s some amount of people called him a groomer. Yeah, I, f I feel like that would probably be a stretch there to call him right. a groomer and, there. Yeah, and so I understand. I don't, I'm not trying to say that you are on, uh, you're, you agree, you're aligned with me on this, but I'm just trying to find the common ground of... Um, the hyper normative like hyper normative expectations of people online are kind of stifling 
to creators for sure, but I think also harmful to the audience when you, that these people are looking up to us and we're all just saying like, well, I'm normal. I don't have any weird thoughts. I think it, I, I think that that makes people just feel bad and alone. I mean, I, 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 again, though, I think that the conflation you're making here, so like having bad thoughts, for example, I have OCD. I've struggled with that since I was a kid. I'm very familiar okay. with having like bad intrusive thoughts pop into my head when I don't want them to be there. I'm familiar right. with that, but that's different than actually having those thoughts, possibly welcoming those thoughts in a way of, of fantasizing there and then feeling some kind of sexual arousal by those thoughts involving prepubescent kids. I feel like the conflation there, I feel like we're conflating a lot. I want people to stop fighting their thoughts. I also, I also am concerned that if you have a latent attraction to children that you can't feel or can't let yourself feel or let yourself even recognize that you are more likely to put yourself in a situation. Like imagine somebody who's in so much denial about their sexual feelings towards children that they then become a priest or they agree to become a camp counselor or they put themselves in situations where if you knew, if you're like, you know, I, I use cuties as porn every week. And then so when someone's like, hey, do you want to babysit my 11-year-old niece? I should say no. But if you don't know that about yourself, if you're not in touch with that, then, you, then it's, it becomes, I think, trying to manage your behavior mm -hmm. and how you fit into society by preventing yourself from being aware of your own thoughts is a dangerous proposition. I would m much rather people know themselves and, and be allowed to know themselves. And I feel like that's part of what we're doing on YouTube is we're telling people that they're not even allowed to know their own thoughts and feelings I and then agree. somehow Sorry. expect them to like hold boundaries out, outside of themselves. I mean, of course I agree that you need to be in touch with your thoughts, but when you say yeah. things like, Hey, I have this thought. So that means I should probably stay away from the 11 year old or whatever. Doesn't that require a level of stigmatization in order for that to, to even I, register I, in your mind? I think the stigmatization should be about your actions and in in anything you're going to do that's going to affect, uh, affect other people. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to show, like, I made, I restricted my But you just said they, they should my stay away from the 11 year old. So you're aware that maybe your, your, those thoughts could be dangerous or lead to something dangerous. So if you no, say, I masturbate I don't, every I, week I don't, to don't, cuties, then. And then you yeah. say, because I'm aware of these thoughts, so that means I shouldn't be around an 11-year-old, doesn't that require a level of stigmatization? No, because you're stigmatizing the action, not the thought. I guess with that stigma, though, doesn't that kind of manifest again in your awareness that these thoughts are wrong, and so that's why you make the decision to okay. stay away from the hypothetical 11-year-old? Yeah, I think it would protect children more if everybody who would masturbate to cuties every week would allow themselves to know that and do that. Because then um, everyone who falls anywhere... My, my sense of, of people's awareness of their pedophilic attractions now is that I think most people who can repress it probably mm -hmm. do and most people are probably hiding their thoughts and feelings from themselves as much as possible and i think some of these people are like powder kegs who are going to offend and who if if it was more normalized to say like to just be in touch with yourself enough to know that you shouldn't be around children i think there's a i think there's a large contingent of people who shouldn't be alone with children who shouldn't be in charge of children but who don't know that about themselves mm -hmm. and have no concept of what to do about that i mean i agree that being in touch with your feelings with your thoughts and with your attractions helps kind of guide the future decisions that you're going to make but i feel like let's say somebody's in touch with the fact that they do have these attractions mm -hmm. to children um I guess I keep going back to the stigma thing, but maybe we're kind of splitting hairs over normalizing and destigmatizing. But 
wouldn't a level of stigma still be necessary in order for the awareness I, of, hey, this thought is wrong, so I need to seek help? I don't or, think hey, the this thought, thought is wrong. Is, or I don't think the thought is okay, wrong. Let me I don't agree this. with you about wrong thoughts. Let me, let me rephrase that. It's wrong for me to be masturbating to cuties every week. I don't think that's so, wrong to masturbate to cuties. Okay, then that's where we would disagree because I feel like if you are masturbating constantly to 11-year-old girls twerking, then you're getting into dangerous pedophilic attractions, which, again, I don't think you should be locked up for that. I don't think the attraction is dangerous. If you're attracted to a child, yeah, it, that could absolutely manifest into a very dangerous situation. It could. You could do something horrible, but you also could just not. I don't think I think masturbating to cuties every week is a sign that there is something wrong with you, but I don't think it makes something wrong with you. Okay, but I feel like if you are masturbating to cuties every week, that action is stigmatized enough so that you are aware that that's not right, and that's why you would seek help. I don't think it's not right. I just think it's. Would you wait? Would you seek help? Would you encourage somebody who told you, "Hey, I masturbate to eleven-year-olds every week." I watch cuties, I get a biggest fucking boner, and I have to come, like, three times a day to cuties. Would you tell this person, like, you need to go and and talk to a therapist or talk to someone about those attractions and those urges because that could manifest in a way that's that's harmful? I would – no. I would say you might want to go to therapy. Okay, so so going to therapy, I guess – But not not because I think – what you're doing is I would say I would say I think you might be self-harming in a way and I think that um, you're going um, like down a dangerous road maybe yeah but a dangerous road of self-harm I mean I, for sure I would say do you are do you think that you're going to I would separate the act of the fantasy and the masturbation. I would, I would definitely ask them, like, do you, are you planning on acting on this? Are you looking at child porn? Are you thinking about looking at child porn? I are, feel like if this, you're masturbating this... to cuties, you're pretty close already to, like, watching child porn. I mean, I know that that movie doesn't actually class of, qualify as literal well, know, child but, porn. But my first question would be, like, are you, are you thinking of looking at things that actually do qualify as child porn? Right, but, like, I, I guess I would want to know, like, what you don't really know if that person's being honest with you. Even That's if they, what reason. if they say the no? Police. So, well, That's I'm not, thinking I, people are lying is not a good reason to thought police. I'm Which, not trying the, to thought police. This is a source. We're talking, for me. wait, wait, wait. Here we're talking about actual actions because we're talking about masturbating to. I don't, masturbation it doesn't count as an action. When you, you're by yourself. You don't think masturbating to children, though, is not. No. A, it's the same as thinking about them. Masturbation is thinking with your hands. I guess I would just say that that action and the arousal of prepubescent kids, especially consistently, is probably a sign that you are a pedophile and that you need to be seeking help. Yes, I completely agree. So the knowledge that you should be seeking help, does that not hinge upon some level of stigmatization? Uh, I, I think we're just getting stuck on... I'm worried that you're using stigmatization, like starving yourself. Should that be stigmatized? Like, yeah, people shouldn't do that. Even if you want to starve yourself. If you're thinking like, I fucking hate eating. I'm managing to eat three meals a day. But I don't deserve it. I'm fat. I shouldn't be eating. I feel disgusting. I hate myself, blah, blah. Those are just thoughts. And maybe you're not acting on them. But if somebody said that to me, I would say like, yeah, you should go to therapy. I wouldn't say you're wrong for thinking that or you shouldn't think about that or those are, those thoughts are wrong. I just think that introduces this powder keg of you trying to stop your thoughts and this fucking nightmare of other people trying to stop my thoughts, which I hate. So I agree with you. If, if by stigmatization you mean if somebody's jerking off to cuties three times a day or more. Um, that is a sign that they should probably seek help. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess we agree enough that obviously if someone's doing that, they should <laughs> they should seek help right away. Um, people are also commenting, too, in my chat that, like, masturbating to children isn't an act that harms children. And I feel like that's that could be true, but it depends on what content you are masturbating to, right? So, like, cuties, here's for example, could, exploiting children. Yeah, the one way it could harm. So I believe cuties is exploitative. 
like you. Okay. I don't think it's that exploitative. I don't think it's that wrong. But I think the movie crosses some lines for me that I'm not comfortable with. If everybody starts watching it three times, and I'm sure Netflix, looking at their um, analytics, they, I'm sure Netflix knows who's masturbating to cuties because they know what scenes you're watching, they know how long you're watching them for, and they know how often you're watching. So Netflix knows that some contingent of people are, are using cuties as porn. I'm sure they are, and I'm sure they know. If, based on the money they're making from that, Netflix decides to make cuties too, and it is similarly exploitative, then, um, yeah, you are you are indirectly harming children by creating a market for exploitative material. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you there for sure. Yeah, I figured you would. So I don't think cuties is like super harmful, and I don't. I I do. I think that the law and Netflix can sort of be in charge of like. Um, where that line is. I'm comfortable with where it is. I, I think they're pushing the line and crossing over it a little bit. If Cuties 2 came out and it didn't have any social commentary and it was just more twerking and more excuses for twerking and it was more like the movie that people were afraid Cuties was like, which is just a subtext for watching teenage girls or uh, preteens twerk, I, th I would probably start speaking out against it uh, right along with you. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so I think that we, we agree with the more broad you, points. Man. It seems like the more the nitty-gritty is where we kind of differ a little bit here. I think, I think where we... I, I'm very afraid of moralizing about whether thoughts are wrong and even calling the thoughts dangerous if the actions that are or even saying that they would lead to, those all freak me out because I've had a lot of thoughts uh, that didn't lead to anything. Sure. Yeah, but I, and, again, I, I like guess the, the worst I think things this I've is done, more than thoughts. We're talking like fantasies that have like a sexual component, and yeah, that does okay tend to that. be more powerful. But I also agree that you can't police thoughts. I I, I agree with you there. I am not in favor okay. of necessarily policing thoughts, but if you're reaching a I, point I where but I don't want to stigmatize them, I don't want to say okay. So I think I think we you we want to move off this thoughts. subject. I think so. I feel like we understand where the other person is, and we're trying to nudge the other person a little bit, and we we just can't. I mean, I, I do understand where you're coming from, yeah, but as long as and I'm I clear that I'm not trying from. to fucking lock people up for having thoughts, yeah, but I do think that if you're you're masturbating consistently to children or child porn or cuties or whatnot, then yeah, you need to be seeking help. And I think we just ultimately I, uh, disagree. I agree. But I think we I disagree on the level of stigma that, that, that that deserves. Yes, but I agree. I agree. If you're masturbating to cuties more than twice a day, you should seek help. All right. I would say if it's more than once a day, is we or if it's if it's at least if it's once a day, then that you probably should seek help. That's where we're gonna have to agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. So, did you have some questions for me as well? Um. Yeah. How are you doing? Doing okay. This conversation was a. It's definitely a little intense, but that's yeah. kind of what you're known for. I know. But I mean, you took a break. Yeah. So I've noticed that streaming is psychologically damaging to everyone, seemingly. Hmm. How so? So uh, it just seems to drive people crazy. <laughs> that and might be more... true. <laughs> Like, I don't, it just seems like everybody kind of snaps after a point. And I can, I can feel it. I can feel why. Um, I think I had much less empathy or understanding for mm -hmm. why people would sort of like start to crack up or crack under the pressure mm -hmm. before I started streaming. And now I see the problems. Yeah. So... And then you asked me to talk and then sort of change your mind and then took a break. Yeah. Yeah. And, that uh, it, that's, it was something like that. Yeah. I think yes. that a lot of people, though, were under the impression that I took a break because, like, the social media was getting to be too much for me or something. Um, yeah. I was honestly going through just a really rough time in my personal life. 
Um, okay. I was withdrawing from, it's funny, people always like to make fun of like the idea of being addicted to weed, but <laughs> I was pretty heavily addicted and dependent on, uh, on marijuana. So yeah. I was withdrawing from that. So I was struggling with a lot of depression there. And then I was also, my psychiatrist had me switching meds, which, uh, I was withdrawing from marijuana and my previous antidepressants at like the same time. So it was just like a month of fucking torture. Um, and I think that a lot of people were kind of under the impression that like the hate got too much for me or, you know, I was cracking under the pressure or whatever, but it was more of a, like, this is an issue that I'm dealing with in my personal life and social media wasn't helping it. So it wasn't exactly like it was the social media that drove me away, but it was the kind of thing like, here I am, I'm really depressed and I've been vulnerable before with my chat too about the fact that like I was struggling with like a significant amount of suicidal ideation, definitely a lot more than I ever have in the past. And so I, I definitely was a little weaker, obviously during that time of my life. So logging on and reading comments saying that, you know, it would be better for my family and everyone if I just fucking killed myself. Like that's the kind of shit that... I, I don't, I just didn't need that in my life right then. I needed to kind of just take a step back. I needed to be away from that so I could just focus and prioritize on getting better and fixing my mental health as much as possible. Thankfully, I'm doing a, a good bit better now, but, you know, it's still an ongoing struggle. It's probably never going to be, it's probably never going to be completely gone. So, yeah. But as far as the, like, streamers are crazy it, i also feel like it might be a chicken and the egg kind of thing right like yeah 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 sure it attracts crazy people it does sure. it does seem to attract crazy people but i don't um, know I've, I've been doing it for such a long time not streaming but just content creation social media being online i i'm kind of just used to it at this point it's just like it's just kind of a normal part of my life now i didn't start my youtube channel until i was 32 hmm so I definitely probably have a different um, – it's probably causing some of these clashes where I'm uh, – where my view of what's normal is super different. So from, what, do you, what do you mean? What, what would you consider your view of being normal that you find being kind of different? Like what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean the cutest thing is a good example. Oh. But, um. Just the idea of streaming. Just people telling you what they're thinking about you uh, from behind a curtain of anonymity in real time, saying whatever they want, uh, trying to be as cutting as possible, pouring salt in your wounds. Yep. Like, uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You're, you're saying that, like, you might have these problems um, anyway without streaming, but, like, it, or, or social media, but... Whatever you're feeling bad about yourself, having thousands of people actively trying to figure out, or in your case, hundreds of thousands of people, trying to actively figure out what would make you feel the worst and then say that mm -hmm. is horrible. It's like everybody is like Britney Spears <laughs> now. Yeah, I mean, I... I... Since I've just, like I said, since I've kind of been dealing with, like, online hate and whatever pretty much since the beginning of the time that I started posting YouTube videos, um, it's kind of become a really normal part for me of life. And I also, I tend to, I tend to try to uh, view the people that hate me and try to cut me down as motivation more than anything. It's sometimes, there, there, so there are two things. Is One, I find it to be very satisfying when I succeed because I know that there are also people that would give anything <laughs> to see me fail. Uh, yeah. I try to keep that mindset a little bit. And then I also have a new policy that I've been doing lately with my streams where if somebody does show up in chat and they start talking like mad shit, I tell them to join my Discord and talk to mm -hmm. me face to face or that I just ban them from the chat. Like I'm like... I don't have time for like these numbskulls to be over here uh, shit talking me left and right in my chat. And then if they're going to be too cowardly to actually show up and defend what they say, then I just block them. And then it's usually also really satisfying because if they do show up, I, I mean, I get to kind of make them look dumb. <laughs> so that can be satisfying. Yeah. But I guess that kind of segues into another subject we wanted to touch on also, which was um, the idea of empathy. 
because I, I'm not very empathetic on this channel. Um, and I know for you, a big part of what you do is trying to be empathetic even towards some of the most worst ideas. Yeah. So why yeah. do you why do you feel that that approach is so uh, so important? Um, I think we're becoming less empathetic as we become more politically polarized. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a very polarized atmosphere where Republicans were basically seen as subhuman. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like my channel. All, yeah. <laughs> yeah, by almost all my peers um, and all the parents and teachers, uh, conservatives were inhuman racist monsters. Mm -hmm. And it was very cozy. It was very nice um, until I hit high school and then I started like kind of criticizing the hypocrisy that I saw and then I was the inhuman monster and then and, and then uh, I think that that's what kind of started me down the road of thinking that empathy really needs to be part of political discourse mm -hmm. and, so what do you mean yeah. exactly when you say empathy because I think that me included when I hear be empathetic like I, I've heard some of your conversations with destiny and whatnot where you talk about like you should even show empathy towards like Nazis, for example. So what yeah. do you mean? Because I think that people, including me, tend to think that that's akin to showing sympathy or being sympathetic towards those people. So so what do you mean exactly by empathy? Do you just mean like trying to understand them? Uh, yeah, putting yourself in their shoes, truly, as as well as you can, mm -hmm. and trying to take on their thoughts and feelings and perspectives as your own as okay. a as a thought exercise or emotional exercise to see how they got where they got and to be able to like withstand and stomach your own hatred or anger right and in, in through that process do you think that taking a non-empathetic approach could ever be beneficial also though um no not really. I don't, because I can empathize with people I disagree with. And I can even empathize with people I'm arguing with or fighting against. Mm -hmm. I think but also. You don't have to I, dehumanize them. I think that I tend to associate being empathetic with being nice. Is that, is that, yeah, incorrect? I'm not that. I think, I think so. I think that is incorrect. Because I think. So I think another thing I'm trying to, and again with the cuties thing, is I'm trying to push the idea of boundaries mm -hmm. as really important and crucial to also being able to empathize with somebody. So I can say, I can empathize with Nazis. I don't want Nazis to come to power mm -hmm. at all. I don't like their ideas. Their ideas are very upsetting, especially like me specifically. They They want to kill me or want to subjugate me or expel me or whatever um right but i can empathize and still keep i can still humanize them and especially with nazis it's it's like the thing that the thing that i'm afraid of is that they're going to dehumanize me so in response i'm going to dehumanize them it just feels very like unchristian not that i'm christian but i think that that's a kind of central tenet of christianity i think is um they know not what they do. And what about the people that do know what they do, though? So, like, there are some Nazis who... They're just evil? Well, no, I wouldn't say they're they're just evil. Like, I mean, I used to be a really pretty big right-winger, so I obviously yeah. understand that people can change. I've seen stories of people that were part of the fucking KKK that have changed and, and gotten Were you anti-Semitic when you were a big right-winger? No, I was never, like, a, a neo-Nazi or a fascist-type person. I, I was more of, like, your kind of normie, conservative, uh, Fox News type. Um, but I still ha held a yeah. lot of really fucked-up views, and I still took great pleasure in mocking a lot of marginalized people and stuff that I've now done a lot of work to, uh, to kind of undo that shit. But I don't know. I, I guess I just feel like I, I totally get what you mean as far as the dehumanizing thing, but I yeah, also that know that for me, for me – what helped change my mind was, I guess, since you, you're saying empathy isn't the same as being nice, because I know that, like, I had debates with people or whatnot who weren't very nice to me, 
and yeah. they didn't seem all too empathetic to me either, to be honest. But by pointing out the insanity of some of my beliefs, it did help push me in the right direction. And so I think it takes a very open minded person to be able to like that's that's if you felt like that feedback was helpful, then that's that's great. But I'm sure there is a way it could have been given to you that would have felt more humanizing and um, humane. I mean, it's it's possible, but I just know that maybe maybe I'm just fucking weird but i know that for me like when i see the more brutal takedowns of people that <laughs> hold harmful beliefs that's the kind of stuff that tends to persuade me more and f at one point i was the guy getting brutally taken down and that's what helped push me in the right direction um of course i'm not saying it was the only thing there was a lot going on in my personal life too i was in a place where i was more receptive to new ideas and whatnot but I just know that for me at least, that's that's what helped me. And so my videos and my streams do tend to also take a more brutal and like uh intense yeah. approach. You know, I, I've said some <laughs> I've said some pretty fucking mean things to uh to conservatives and, and bigots and whatnot, but I, I guess I, I also feel like there are people that maybe I'm not going to change the mind of so let's say I'm I'm arguing with a conservative and I'm being really mean to that person and maybe even like dehumanizing them a little bit uh, okay. so I can recognize that that's probably not going to change that guy's mind that I'm talking to for various reasons humiliate him in front of his audience then yeah like exactly him. and also on top of that I mean he has his ego invested in his ideas so even if he realizes he's wrong he's probably not going to fucking admit it but I, I tend to think about it as not so much as the person I'm talking to, but for the audience perspective. So if there are right-wingers in my chat viewing the, the debate as it goes on, their right. ego isn't on the line. And they're thinking, hey, these ideas really do seem fucking stupid. I mean, I use the term brain dead a lot and people get mad at me for it. But I, I feel like by by showing the insanity of some of these beliefs in a more brutal way, it does help to change minds even from like an audience perspective i think there's a risk of um dunking on somebody and you're not even right but you're just good at shitting on them and you persuade people to agree with you not because your ideas are good or because you've provided like a like a warm safe conversation or a space for them to explore their ideas but just because you won the fight um, but I, I don't, I don't want to, and I don't want to participate in that. Sure. And I'm not saying that you need to participate in that. I'm just wondering if you can see the benefit in that style at all. <laughs> well, I, my, my channel is you're much more trying to get people to agree with you. Well, that's also because I tend, I used to hold a lot of those conservative beliefs. So I feel like you're fighting the demon within. No, no, I mean, it's not that deep. It's more of like, I feel as though I recognize how harmful and backwards those beliefs really are. And so, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know, I do tend to feel more impassioned to try and dispel the myths or the beliefs that I used to hold. And I recognize what you mean, too, that, like, what if you're just better at debate and so you are winning purely on, like, a, a rhetorical <laughs> yeah, level? But the, Clearly, that's happening all over the place. It's hard to know who is, you know... No one, no one thinks they're the one doing that. But if you look around, somebody's doing it because people are getting won over uh, on, on all sides all the time to all kinds of different ideologies um, by winning debates. So, uh, you know. But isn't that a testament to the fact that winning debates is does do some some positives? I guess it also depends what your end goal is, right? So yeah, I mean, when I when I talked to Richard Spencer, I was like. If you come out of this conversation looking like an idiot and you lose a chunk of your audience to Richard Spencer, I'm going to be very upset with you. That's probably the most nervous I've ever been for a discussion with anybody. Really? Yeah, because I'm like, I know he's a great speaker. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, it's not... And I'm not fighting for people to agree with me. So I'm not trying to debate him. I'm not trying to win him over or convince anyone of anything. And so if he decides that that's where he wants to go, 
and he's much more educated than I am about like history, mm -hmm. which is where he's probably going to draw most of his arguments from if he wants to um, convince me that authoritarianism or convince my audience that authoritarianism and racism and fascism are good. If he wants to turn into a debate, all I can do is say like, hey, I don't want to debate you, which just makes it look like a concession and like can just make me look like hor like it could, it could have been horribly irresponsible and and i wouldn't have i wouldn't have been like well maybe he's right it would just be like he's just good at it right and, and I, that... I i totally recognize that too because i've seen people before debate and even though i can tell like cause now that i've been really immersing myself in the sort of like the debate bro sphere or whatever i can totally yeah. see where some people are Debating either in a little bit bad faith, but they're good enough at it that they're able to to just control the conversation to go the direction that they want it to go. I can see I that, that, but shit. I also feel like there are some viewpoints that that are correct. <laughs> you just need to smite. Well, no, 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 not at all. I'm saying there are some viewpoints that are are just objectively correct. And so it's, it's <laughs> I don't an, agree. I guess I just don't agree with you. Yeah, I think that that might just be where we disagree. And I know that your your approach is definitely more, you know, you want people to think you want people to just like challenge themselves and whatnot. Whereas for me, I am trying to convince people that some of these You're Republican beliefs are wrong. You're trying to convert people. In a way, yeah, but I don't want to convert people just purely by me like, oh, I'm better at rhetoric. But I also want to convert people by like, not only am I able to beat this person in a debate, but I'm able to beat them because the facts are on my side. I, I, no, I don't, yeah, I don't want to do that. I want people just to think about their beliefs and their feelings and kind of inter the intersection thereof. And my favorite comments I get are when people say, um, I don't agree with you. But watching this video helped me figure out what I think about this. Hmm. Yeah, and you do a good job at it. I mean, I've I've watched your uh, debate with on uh, with uh, Destiny on trans issues, and I was pausing it every few minutes actually to like just think through what you were saying. And um, I I still don't didn't didn't really agree with you much at all about your uh, your opinion on that. But it did I did appreciate the fact that you really pushed me as a viewer to think about these things and. You know, I, I was stopping, I was researching here and there, just, just thinking through it more deeply, I guess. Yeah, the, the gender, trans, like, kind of ongoing debate is a tricky one because thinking through it out loud is perceived by some people as bigoted or hateful in itself. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that's one. And then um, I think it, it, for the um, more traditionalist conservative view... I think thinking through it out loud and really questioning like what are men and women also to them probably feels like gaslighting or just like crazy, crazy town. Yeah. And so I think, I think for both sides, it's, it's uncomfortable to really sit down and think about where the other side's coming from. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think, yeah, that's definitely, that's the topic where I feel like debate doesn't really serve very well. And then if you, even if you win the debate, if you're sort of like, questioning the trans narrative mm -hmm. um you just look like a bigoted asshole i mean i think that there's i, I would want to know i mean I, i'm not trying to get super deep into this conversation but like i would ask first of all like what is the trans narrative and what are the questions being asked because i think that there are absolutely ways that you can you can go about those conversations and it's true that you'll you'll probably have some woke scold on Twitter that says you're a transphobic bigot because you dared question yeah, yeah. or whatever. But I think that yeah. there are room for those there there are there's room for those conversations as well. I guess I'm just wondering if because I can see the benefit of some of the content you do. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you're able to see any of the benefit of the type of content that I do as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am left leaning. Okay. So when I see somebody, I mean, I guess not on, on trans issues. Well, in some ways I am, mm -hmm. but not, not the whole nine yards. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Is there a satisfaction if I see somebody, um, ripping apart an idea that I also dislike and feel is harmful and don't want to spread like it? it yeah. It feels good. Sure.
and like but I ultimately I don't I don't know if I think it's productive okay yeah I mean I, I obviously I, I just purely from my own uh, uh, experiences which I don't really like to try to appeal to anecdotes very much but I feel like it can be for pro- you it was yeah. yeah and and because for me it was and I've seen other people also just doing this who it's been productive for them also but again I think that this really ultimately just comes down to what are our end goals right my end goal is to get more people thinking rationally logically and usually as they begin to think that way that kind of comes along with a more left-leaning <laughs> perspective if I'm being honest um yeah I don't I just don't yeah sorry go ahead no, I was just going to say, so I think that there is definitely some value there. But I also, I can see, like I said, I see the value in what you do also. I think it just comes down to kind of what our what our end goal is that, here with the content creation. I would say that the agenda I'm pushing the most is not a, doesn't have a spot on the political spectrum. It's more a agenda of um, free speech and free thought. And um, sort of like free feeling of like being able to talk about feelings, being able to normalize talking about feelings, even feelings that are weird. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm more focused on that and, and yeah, the humanization okay. more than I want my side to win. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. And I mean, I, I try to I, – I don't tr- – I don't like the idea of like my side versus their side very much because I have some opinions that would not be really accepted by like more left leaning stuff either. Like I more. more want people to come to conclusions or at least I do want people ultimately to agree with me, of course, but I want them to agree with me based on logical and critical thinking. And I want them to get there, not because they saw some dude they don't like get ripped apart in a debate but rather because they actually did critical thinking. that Because that's kind of what I underwent, is where I was doing a lot of, of research on my own. I was thinking very critically about some of these concepts and some of these uh, like homophobic things that I used to spread or whatever. And with that came a change in my beliefs that wasn't rooted in like the aesthetic of seeing somebody get wrecked in a debate, but was rather like, hey, these ideas are they they are correct as opposed to my previous beliefs i'm not being very specific there but just generally like i i i don't want people to kind of just be on one side or the other one team or the other either i want people to be critical come of their the own correct side. Come and to i want the them to be correct opinion, yeah I, which I, also but it happens to be your opinion well i'm correct about everything so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you used to be homophobic yeah Yep. Uh, and you used to be religious? Yes, but my homophobia did not spread or didn't really stem very much from my religious beliefs. Um, okay. It stemmed much more from just – I think it, it, it was – I was young when I started making content, so a lot of my reasoning was very shallow and very, very weak. So some of it was just that I liked being edgy and politically incorrect and that mm-hmm. entailed – partially shitting on gay people which i totally recognize now that's fucked up but it it wasn't like that deep but there's a feeling of freedom in it there may have been a feeling of freedom in it but also it was just like i think that i would see like the the sensitivity that i didn't like very much and i kind of wanted to to break that apart and and not give a fuck about the feelings or not care about the sensitivity of, of that group i guess which I mean, I still, like I said, I mean, we just had the conversation about empathy. I'm still not really very keen on, like, honoring people's sensitivities and their feelings as much as I am arguing from more of a, a empirical standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it, it's, I don't know, it was a complicated thing where I would just, there was a lot of, like, what the LGBT community would push at the time that I didn't agree with. So I would be the type of person to say, like, hey, of course gay people deserve rights. Of course it's fine if gay people want to get married. I wasn't to the extent where I was like, gay marriage isn't real marriage. I was never like to that point. But I was just more like, yeah, they can live their lives freely, but I'm going to shit on them relentlessly. Mm -hmm. Which was fucking shallow. And, and, you know, I I would 
now I would argue against that because of just purely of the harm that that causes. Um, but yeah, at the time, like I, I didn't think as deeply about my positions as I do now. What do you disagree with the left about now that you were alluding to? Um, I mean, the far left is pretty communist, uh, which I don't agree with. And then I got in some shit with the uh, the left not too long ago on Twitter <laughs> over um, identity politics. I'm not a big fan of identity politics. I've seen that used repeatedly to justify really dumb ideas or to shut people up because they're not of this one group. So they're not allowed to have an opinion on this thing. Um and I also tend to, to sometimes just get in controversy with them because of my more abrasive style. Um, I think that mm -hmm. there's a definitely a group of people on the left that care very deeply about the aesthetics of looking like a good, nice, friendly liberal or nice, friendly leftist. And I don't really play by those rules. I'm fine being mean. And if I see something dumb, then I usually call it dumb right on Twitter and I don't really hold back. So there are some things there that's more like an aesthetic disagreement, but then there are also positional disagreements as far as like communism or even things about like the CIA, for example. Like I, I don't think the CIA is as bad as a lot of le uh, lefties kind of make it out to sound, and I got in a bunch of controversy for that. So I try – like I said, I just – I try to take a position based on the empirical evidence or the rationale or critical thinking there – I don't like to take a position just because, oh, this is what the left believes. Oh, this is what the right believes. I want to reach a conclusion based on my own research and my own critical thinking. And it is true that a lot of my positions as far as systemic racism and LGBT issues do line up with much more lefty kind of positions. I don't just blindly follow the left or blindly follow the right. I try to think through each position and reach a conclusion there. And that's kind of the goal that I want my audience to, uh, that's kind of my goal for, for my viewers to reach as well. Um, you, uh, I've heard that you used to be Christian and now you're an atheist. Is that accurate? Um, I mean, technically, yeah, I, I'm more agnostic if anything, because I recognize that like, there's a possibility that maybe an, a greater deity yeah, yeah. exists but i'm i'm just not really functionally convinced. atheist functionally atheist sure yeah that's a good way of putting it um when did that happen that happened when i was still conservative actually so for a while i was i was like one of the few conservative atheists <laughs> um, how long ago was this this was back in 2017 was when I first posted my video kind of just talking about like why I'm, I'm starting to really not be convinced by the Christianity arguments or the, the arguments in okay. favor of God were not really very convincing to me. Have you always been atheist or? I, I was raised atheist. Okay. I, I asked my father if there was a God once when I was like eight and he said probably not. <laughs> That was and it, that huh? Was kinda, that was the extent of my religious upbringing, yeah. Man, so literally polar opposites for us, where I was raised in a very religious, very Christian environment. Um, you know, religion and the Bible and going to church were massive parts of my upbringing. Uh, yeah, I think I uh, set foot in a synagogue maybe twice in my life for family, friends, or stuff like that, but I never... Uh, no, no mention of. Uh, I don't. I don't think I even knew that I was half Jewish until I was like thirteen or something. Oh, Just, wow. I was raised with no concept of religion uh, as something other than like on TV. Also, because my um, my hometown is very like non-religious. Hmm. Um, so none of my friends believed in God growing up either. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just uh, funny hearing you say that because it's it is literally the opposite. I mean, even my wife, I, like I I met her at church, so that was yeah, just the type so, of environment I was always raised in. Is she Christian? Um, I don't. You you can talk to her about it because I know she's gonna come on here next and talk to you. Um, yeah. I don't know if she would consider herself like a Christian. I know she's against organized religion though. Okay. And she definitely she makes. Still, she may still believe that Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior. Uh, I mean, I know that she makes – she definitely has given the strongest arguments in favor of Christianity that I've heard. So okay. 
I don't know if maybe she would be considered like a Christian apologia at some some points, but I think that yeah, she she has definitely laid out some arguments in the best faith or the most charitable way, and okay, it hasn't convinced me, but I do think that it's helped in in me form my, some of my arguments. I had a weird conversation when I started dating my girlfriend. Yeah, where I was like, if we're gonna like. Um, be life partners. Like, if we're gonna get married eventually, mm -hmm. if this is gonna be a long term thing, I need you to believe in death. I mean? can't. I can't really spend my life with somebody who can't accept that we're actually going to die. So if you think that we're gonna, you know, become spirits or whatever, or be reincarnated or any any of the what I see as kind of like desperate escape routes that people fantasize about. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we're going to be able to like, that that's like, that's like, I think my only like ideological deal breaker of like, I need us to be on the same page that we're animals and animals die. So when you say death, I guess you just mean like kind of how it was before we were born. Yeah. Just, you just don't exist anymore. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of come to I, I've I'm working to accept that myself. It's definitely like a sad thing to accept. Um, I would like there to be something after death, but me too. You, but I know that the most realistic thing is obviously that, yeah, you just your brain is no longer functioning and you cease to exist. And I used to like I've heard stories before of people that are like, you know, I saw life after death or whatever. But aren't they just having like a DMT trip before yeah, it's before a, you it's, die? It's what, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, even when people say like, I saw the clouds or I saw a loved one or whatever, it's like, mm, you may have in your head, like it was probably just, cause I know your brain releases a bunch of that chemical, like a DMT or D, the DMT, right. or whatever. I don't know the technical term, but yeah. So I, it makes sense that you would trip out for like the next couple seconds as your brain is kind of dying. And then that's it. Do you uh, argue about this? Um, or do you what, care? What do you mean? Like, argue with, about death? With your wife? Yeah. Oh, um, that that's definitely, that wouldn't be an ideological deal breaker for me, no. It's an interesting conversation, and, you know, it's like I said, I, I there are people obviously in my life that have died that I, I love very much, and I, I like to believe that they are still somewhere or still existing on some level, but I know that the most realistic uh, outcome is probably that, yeah, it's just, you're just done existing. You're not suffering. You're not anywhere. You're just, it's like how you were before you were born. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, from my understanding, you've been with your girlfriend for a while. So I guess she believes in death. She fucking better. <laughs> well, there you go. But that's something we talk about too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I framed it as like, you need to swallow this pill. Mm-hmm. I need you to take the red pill. <laughs> the death pill. But the death, the black pill. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I feel like, do you, do you feel like once you accept that, there's a level of comfort in that, though? No. Really? I dread death. Yeah, I don't want to die at all. I'm just terrified of death. I don't know. For me, sometimes, maybe it's just, you know, the depression in me, but sometimes I feel like... It's <laughs> like, well, at least this will all end. Yeah, well, honestly, yes. Yeah. Sometimes pain, it's comforting just knowing end. that, like, I don't have to be afraid of hell, because growing up, I was very terrified of going to hell. Um, yeah. Just being raised religious, of course. So there's not really anything. Just You're just done. You're, you're not existing anymore. And to me, that sometimes is a little comforting to think about. Maybe it's uh, yeah. maybe it's only comforting though because I was raised in an environment where I, I was taught that like there's the possibility of there being like eternal suffering in the lake of fire or whatever. Yeah, I guess that sounds better than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think I'd actually rather be tortured for eternity than die. Than just not exist, really. Yeah, I really don't want to die. Well, nobody wants to die. I mean, I don't want to fucking die, but. But I really don't want to die. I'm. I'm. I don't know. I feel like there's, I don't know. I, I don't know where to take the conversation. I mean, I feel like there is, in my opinion anyway, it's a little bit comforting knowing that like when you die, that's it. It's over. 
when I think of loved ones that I have that have died, like they're not suffering. They're not anywhere anymore. They're just, they're just gone. It's an eternal sleep or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, can I ask about, uh, being famous and having kids? Um, sure. I'm not really that famous though, but I would talk about it. Well, you're, you're famous enough to, um, want to shield your kids from the, the limelight or the haters, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I post some vlogs with them on, um, this one app, but the app, funnily enough, doesn't actually allow for comments. It's a type of app that you can only respond with a video response. So whenever it I post, it helps. It does yeah. actually. It really helps keep like the trolls away. Um, yeah. But whenever I post photos of me with my kids on on Instagram, yeah, I'm I check the comments very frequently to make sure that no one's saying anything that's fucking creepy. And then if they do, then I you know I block them immediately. <laughs> But yeah, um, you yeah. I don't know. I think I might want a baby one day, you know? Yeah. It's pretty fun. Sometimes. Sometimes it Som sometimes they sure. kind of drive you crazy, but you know, that's just parenting. Yeah. I've dealt with babies before, so I, I know I know what you're talking about. I've I've caretaken them before. Um But the idea of a uh, Especially with me, I don't. I, I. There's probably more people who hate you, but probably a higher percentage of people who know of me who hate me. I think that might be true. So, yeah. Are you worried about um, like there being like threats or like your child actually being like in physical danger? Not really. More just unpleasant, weird, creepy comments. Yeah videos yeah i'll tell i'll be honest the thing that i worry about more is probably like my kids getting a little older and then like discovering my content or like watching me like i i don't want yeah my daughter i mean she's only three right now but thinking about like when she's like seven or eight or nine or whatever like i don't want her watching start my to videos. figure that shit out yeah yeah i mean she can she uh, can yeah, know what i, mean, I do what is... but i I don't want her going yeah. watching my debates or whatever. Like that's how old does my daughter have to be before she can watch the cuties review? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You might it want to save like that an one uncomfortable for uncomfortable conversation. It's an uncomfortable conversation to have. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is kind of weird too, just to think about like you have a kid and who loves you, but there's a lot of people that don't love you at all. <laughs> actually, hate you, <laughs> hate your fucking guts. But yeah, that's not a normal experience to have as a kid to like talk to people who just think your father is like a degenerate exactly uh, idiot yeah but i mean it is what it is and and i try to you know i try to shield them from that as much as possible and also i mean it's my my main job and it's my my source of income so for all the haters i have i also am providing for them with the the shit that i do so it's a, yeah. it's a trade-off but it is what it is you know yeah do you see this as a long-term job? Um, I mean, I pretty consistently... Are you ready? My wife's ready to talk next, by the way. Um, okay. I mean, I, I've kind of gone back and forth. There have been times where I've... You know, the YouTube thing has gotten either so exhausting or whatever that I've kind of wanted to just quit. And I've yeah. applied for other jobs, usually like video editing shit or whatever. But I just... I've gotten really far in the interview process, but I've never like clinched one of them and then it usually happens that after i am rejected for the job i'm like well i guess it, you know i have nothing right now except my youtube so i just kind of i keep finding myself coming back to it and just grinding harder and harder and just i don't know if it's long term i would like to see it lead to something else long term but i just i don't know if i would be able to do a job long term where i'm working for a boss i don't know if i can yeah. do that so yeah interactions with bosses are pretty uh miserable yeah exactly <laughs> it's actually funny I, i'll wrap up with this story and then i'm gonna let my wife talk um because over here i'm the decision maker um <laughs> as it should be but <laughs> some I, traditions ex should be that's um, yeah that's the one tradition we still hold by you know i'm i'm good. the leader here <laughs> good for you um but 
it's funny because before I quit I, my job and then just was pursuing YouTube full time, um, I worked at a clothing store for, you know, legal purposes. I can't say which, but um, I posted a very controversial video in my conservative days about trans people. And believe me, for anything controversial you think you like any controversial opinion you think you hold about trans people, you will never be able to beat my video, The Truth About Transgenders, which was my one of my first like super controversial videos when I only had like 7,000 subscribers. And I got a call from my work and I was like, oh shit. I was like, this is it. I'm about to get fired from my job for the, for the YouTube video I made. And turns out they were only asking me to take off from my Facebook that I worked there. <laughs> Um, oh, that's good. That's so I was reaction. like, "That's this is fair enough." I I was pretty surprised when I got like a call from the corporate office. I thought I honestly thought I was gonna get terminated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just I don't know. It's kind of a funny story because I was I was like kind of scared because I was like, "Oh man, I I'm not ready to quit this job yet." <laughs> hey, that seems like a very reasonable reaction from them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really appreciate the conversation. The um, I know the beginning was a little intense, but uh. You know, the rest of the conversation was really pretty chill, so I appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, man. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the bell so you get notified when I drop a new video.